Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third session in American English Live Series 12. We're so excited that each of you are here with us today. My name is Kate, and I will be with you today along with my colleague behind the scenes, Amanda, who will be serving as moderator to help answer your questions and respond to your comments during today's session. Let's begin today with these wonderful audience comments from our previous webinar, Activate 21st Century Skills with Board Games in the Classroom. So first we have Jamila Jamilu in Nigeria. Before this seminar, I was not even aware of 21st century skills, but now I have added lots to my knowledge as well as to my students. Wonderful comment. Thank you for sharing that, Jamilu. Maria Gabriel in Guatemala says, I have not used game boards since I started teaching online. This session provided me with fantastic ideas to do it. Thank you very much. And we hope that you've been able to use some of those great ideas in your classroom. And finally, from Akiko in Japan, who says, this session made me realize that playing board games in class is not only for fun, but for fostering students' ability to thrive in the 21st century. The idea of releasing some control to students used to sound irresponsible, but now it's completely opposite. To grow plants, you need rain. Wonderful comment. Thank you for sharing. We love to see our teacher participants actively engaged in professional development. So please continue to share your thoughts and photos about our webinars by adding them to the comments or chat box or by emailing them to American English webinars at FHI360.org. We may feature one of your comments or photos during the next session. Throughout series 12, we are exploring the themes of English for specific purposes, tourism and cultural exploration, 21st century skills in the English language classroom, and teaching STEAM to English language learners. We hope you will be able to use the practical ideas we share. Are you eagerly awaiting one of these sessions? Let us know in the chat box. So here's what to expect today. The session will be about 60 minutes long. The presenter will present the material and I, as your host, will ask questions and make comments too but we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. Please do share your thoughts using the comments feature or chat box. And when our session comes to a close in about an hour, you will have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the webinar, click on a link that we will share in the comments and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly, and once you've successfully done so, you can expect to receive your badge via email within about a week. And before we begin, I wanted to let you know about a massive open online course, or MOOC, that is now open and is also very free. Integrating critical thinking skills into the exploration of culture in an EFL setting, or sometimes we just call it ICT for short, Integrating Critical Thinking. This free MOOC will help you develop an understanding of culture, prepare to implement culture and critical thinking lessons, and consider options for evaluating student progress in these areas. The course is now open and you can see the dates listed here on the slide. Learn more and enroll today using the link being shared in the chat box and comments. And now for today's session, the STAIR Framework for Interactive Online Activities. An interactive classroom makes learning more memorable, creates opportunities for communicative practice, and can even lessen the workload of teachers. This session will introduce the STAIR framework, which participants can use to design interactive activities for use in both online and in-person classrooms. The presenter will also share several example activities that participants can use in their, your classrooms. And now we're pleased to introduce our presenter, Stephanie Upadjai. Stephanie is a lifelong learner and educator with over 12 years of experience in the TESOL field. She began her career as a Fulbright English teaching assistant in Chile and has since taught students and trained teachers in Turkey, India, Ukraine, North Africa, and the United States. Some of her professional projects include creating nationwide teacher training programs, leading curriculum development projects, providing one-on-one -on -one coaching to teachers and program directors, 
and facilitating workshops for teachers and leaders. Originally from Connecticut, Stephanie holds a CELTA and an MA in TESOL from Adelphi University. In her free time, you can find her reading a book, hiking with her husband, or playing cooperative board games with friends. Welcome, Stephanie. We're so happy to have you here with us today. Thank you. Thanks for the great introduction, Kate. And welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to share this framework with you today and equally excited to see what a global audience we have. So thanks for participating in the poll. That was really fun to see. And hopefully after today's session, you'll be able to reach new heights with your interactive activities. So let's take a look at our objectives. And the first one is you'll be able to use three specific activities in your class. Um, the emphasis is on online activities, but you can certainly adapt them to an in-person context. Additionally, um, you'll be able to use the framework to design interactivity, interactive activities. So I'll have some uh, prompts that you can ask yourself when you're designing your own activities. And then throughout the session, uh, you'll be able to reflect on the design of your classroom activities. Maybe you can think of a way to um, improve them or change them just a little bit to make them even more interactive. So we know what we want to achieve and how are we going to do it? Uh, so the first part of our agenda will introduce you to the, st the STAIR framework and uh, the benefits, how it came, up, came about. And then we'll also look at three activities, but in, and we'll include an analysis and break them down so you know how they work. And finally, we'll have a chance to reflect. So before I really get started, I have a question for you. So what are some challenges that you have faced in your online teaching? Yes, we'd love to hear from you, everybody. We've all had to face a lot of challenges during these last many months, and we would love to hear what are some of those challenges uh, related to online teaching. So what do you think, everybody? What are some of those challenges that you have noticed? And I'm going to take a look over here at my other screen, too, just to see here. Um, Cespede says um, empathy, so maybe it's hard to connect. Christina says children get distracted. Absolutely. What are some other challenges that you've seen? Eliciting a response from Anil. Very good. That's a good point. Sometimes students just want to keep their camera off and be muted. <laughs> That's never fun for the teacher. Students' engagement, inter internet connection from Heymar, the attention of students from Nancy. Isabella, coming up with new and interesting material for every class. Absolutely. There's a lot of prep involved with online teaching. And sometimes a lack of participation from Zoe. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for sharing. Yes, thank you. And I've definitely experienced those challenges myself. So in addition to teaching online classes, um, my interest in this topic came while working with Access teachers in Ukraine, and they were facing those challenges that you mentioned. So our project goal was to make online classes more interactive and engaging. So while we were focused on the challenges of online classes, I do believe that really these challenges kind of apply to teaching. Therefore, the solutions will apply to your online classes as well as your in-person in classes. Um, so some of the challenges that you mentioned, but specifically the access teachers said, were a lot of prep um, so you have to be extra organized online and it can be really difficult to make small adjustments between two your materials. Also, we have uneven participation that came up a lot in your feedback. So it can be challenging to balance this if you have reluctant speakers or even just a couple students who dominate discussions. And of course, it's complicated. Um, in an online environment where you can just kind of hide by turning off your camera. 
So you can feel someone mentioned it's hard to elicit uh, responses because some people just choose to stay in the background. And this brings us to disengaged students. Um, so it's challenging online because we're competing for students' attention. So we really need to make sure we use our class time wisely and as much as possible for interactive activities. And so I took these questions, uh, I'm sorry, I took these challenges and posed some questions whose answer could solve the problems. So, um, how can students create or source materials? So maybe uh, if I can get students to do more during class, I don't have to prepare as many materials. And once we have those materials, whether it's from me or my students, how can we get the most use out of them instead of quickly going to the next thing? When it comes to uneven part participation, uh, I definitely understand the uh, <laughs> that feeling of not wanting to answer a question if I don't have to. So how can we get students to demonstrate evidence of learning? How can we require every student to show that they're participating and that they're able to um, use the material that you're covering? And finally, once I get students to produce meaningful work, how can I take it further to engage them? So why should students be listening to each other? How can I extend the platform so it's not only me giving feedback all the time? And of course, why we're all here today, how can we facilitate more interaction? So answering these questions led me to a great book. It's called Interaction Online. And that's um, a big part of where this STAIR framework came from. So what does STARE stand for? Well, even though there are five letters, this, uh, uh, this framework only has four parts. So they are stimulus, the way we get students' attention, action, the thing every student has to do, interaction, how we get students to talk to each other or interact with each other's work, and finally, the recap, how we pull everything together. And I want to be clear that this really applies to an activity. So it could be just a, a piece of your lesson. It might also be your whole class. Um, so you can use it to design one really strong activity. So why should we think about an activity this way? What are the benefits? Well, the first one, we know that for students, it's easy to get lost or overwhelmed during an online class or distracted, and then it's really hard to ask for help. So what I like about using a framework is it has multiple stages. So in between, you can have small check-ins, you can do a mini lesson if you can tell that students aren't really able to do the next piece. Um, and of course, you have opportunities to pause for clarification. Also, when our students are expected to just kind of sign on and listen to a lecture, it's even easier to get distracted. So our framework prioritizes students' involvement um, through active learning. It's also a little bit predictable so that students kind of know what to expect from each activity. And students have a reason to pay attention because they know they'll have to produce work based on your session or on your class. And finally, online learning can be really lonely. Um, but here, when we use the framework, students can get feed, <clears throat> excuse me, students can get feedback from their teacher as well as their classmates. And you might be wondering what types of things, excuse me, one second. What types of things we can do at each stage. So let's take a look. So for our attention getting stimulus, we can, um, this can be a whole class activity, individual work or group work. We can do things like have students react to a photo, complete a survey, do a dictation, <clears throat> just listen to or watch something or maybe read a model paragraph. For the action ideas, 
This is the task that students complete. So they might tell or write a story or answer questions, interview a partner, describe a picture, fill out a worksheet or a chart, or just generate a list. And for the interaction, ways we can get students to listen to each other or read their work, we can do things like have students agree or disagree, ask follow-up questions, find things that they have in common, which is really great for building rapport, uh, interpret results, like what do you think this means? Can we draw any conclusions? They can also rate or rank something. And I think I put this at the end on purpose, they could peer edit. I put it at the end because it really does require a lot of relationship building before you ask students to critique each other's work. And finally, for recap, uh, you can do things like make a list, have a vote, answer a reflection question. If you're out of time or there's uh, not as much to do, you can keep it really simple and just thank students for their participation. Um, and you can also combine that with reporting what you as the teacher noticed. So it could be positive reinforcement, like, oh, great job on this activity. I heard many people using our target vocabulary. That was great. Or, wow, I saw a really wide range of grammar structures in your comments to each other. Or great job asking each other for clarification. So that's a nice way to give feedback. And you can also have students do that same thing with the reflection questions. Okay, so I have another question for you. In your teaching or just in general, which of the stages is most often skipped? So is it that attention getter, the stimulus, the task that students do, the action, interaction, or the recap? Yeah, what, <clears throat> what do you think everybody? Which stage of this framework is most often skipped in your opinion? It might be your classroom or it might be um, just something that you've noticed in general with um, in, your, in your school or around you. What do you think? Which is most often skipped? Stimulus, action, interaction, or recap? Let's see, Irene says recap, Mariana says recap. So does Zamu, so does Yulia. Julia says recap. Um, Tehran says recap or interaction. Mariana also thinks recap. Christina says interaction. Um, Rian, Rian Reese says there's not usually time to do recap, which is I think something that teachers often feel. You're trying to get so much in that it's hard to squeeze that extra couple of minutes in there for recap. All right, you know what? We are seeing a resounding recap over here. So uh, thanks for your, and some interaction. Thanks for your responses, everybody. Yes, thank you so much. And actually it's the same for me. One I keep trying to do better is the recap so that we end on a high note or have a sense of closure for our activity. Um, but, and I'm also glad that many of you mentioned interaction since that's the focus. So let's take a look at what can happen when pieces of the framework are missing. So if we don't have a stimulus, it, it might, you might have a lack of an engaging start uh, to the class entirely or just to this one particular activity. Uh, it can also sound some, like something like open your books to page 17. So not really a great attention getter when that's so important online. Um, if we don't have action, then we really don't have a chance for students to participate. Could be a lot of teacher talk time. And then really importantly, there's a lack of opportunities for students to show what they know or what they can do. And I, again, wanna emphasize that in the action, everyone has to do it. So it's not just a volunteer basis. So we get everyone to participate, hopefully. And if we're missing interaction, this came up in, in our warm up question. So we can have a lack of rapport or empathy between students. The teacher becomes the only source of feedback, which is very draining and very hard to do online in particular. 
And even if you try to acknowledge everyone's work or um, get everyone to speak up, we often run out of time, which you guys already said can be an issue. And then if we don't have a recap, uh, there's lack of a closure after an activity and we miss opportunities for reflection or for students to really think a little more deeply about what they just learned or practiced. So let's get into our first activity. And I have a question for all of you. So look at this picture. And would you try this extreme sport? Why or why not? All right, let us know, everyone. We are going to find out how adventurous you all are. Looks like this person is bungee jumping. Would you try this extreme sport? Or have you tried it? Let us know why or why not. Let's take a look here. What do you think, everybody? Let us know in the chat what you would do. Would you try this or not? I am not 100% sure what I would do, to be honest. Let's see, Rin Grease says, no, I am afraid of heights. All right, that's totally valid. Maria Mariana says the same, I would not. I would not feel safe. Good thinking. I would have a heart attack, says Cespedes. I hope not. <laughs> Chow says, no, it's dangerous. Let's see. Um, a lot of people saying it looks crazy and, gener and dangerous. Vinya says this, I would not dare from Turan. Yulia, yes, actually, I did something like that before and I'm not afraid of heights. All right, sounds good. And one more from Mina, she says, I'd go for it because I like adventure. Sounds good. So it sounds like we have a mix of responses there um, from our wonderful audience. Thank you for responding, everybody. Yes, thanks for sharing. And for the record, I wouldn't do it either. I'd be afraid. <laughs> um, so you all just experienced the stimulus for our first activity, which is called a sense of adventure. And this is a great activity for getting students to share opinions, use idiomatic expressions like you just shared, and using descriptive language. So let's see the instructions for use in a classroom. So if I were doing this online, I would display this image of an extreme sport or adventure sport, and we could discuss this as a whole class or also um, in small groups, if we have time, if we want to. So then I ask a few questions. So in three words or less, what is your initial reaction to this photo? Uh, usually is a great time to teach the word yikes, which is something you can say when you're afraid of something. Um, I also ask, imagine you are this person, how do you feel? So you get a lot of those adjectives. And finally, what is this sport? Would you do it? Why or why not? So this is going to pull our students into our activity, get them ready to do a little more. So let's look at the instructions for the action phase and I'll show you some student work. So these are instructions that I post for students. And for this activity, I use Padlet, which I highly recommend. It's basically an interactive digital bulletin board where you and your students can post photos or videos um, as well as text and respond to each other. And um, so I list, I list the instructions there and give students three questions to answer in writing. So same thing, you're the person in this picture, how do you feel, what is this sport? What should participants, uh, what do participants need to know? And would you do it? Why or why not? So here's one example of some student work. And so we have bungee jumping, it's back. And Natalia says, I'm on the fence about taking up this kind of sport. It would really make me nervous and frightened. So we see a great idiomatic expression. I'm on the fence when you're not sure which way to go. And here's another piece of student work. The text's a little small, but I can read it. It's, uh, it's for zip lining. And it says, I am a person in the picture. And I felt absolutely elated. And then there's more description. But a highlight for me here is that 
Uh, I love how this student was able to share their own picture and really get excited to talk and answer the questions. Uh, so let's see how we can have students respond to each other. So again, here are the instructions. I'd post them on that same Padlet page. And this is, uh, this is what it says. So comment on three posts. First, read the post and see if the person would do the sport. If you agree, say why. And if you disagree, try to persuade them to change their mind. And if three people have already commented, please choose a different post. When you're finished, change your post to purple so I know you're done. So I really like how this requires students to understand the opinion, to, to read or really to listen to their classmates and then include a persuasive piece. And that last thing about changing the color of the post is a classroom management technique that helps me keep track of the pace of the activity. So let's see students work again and how they responded. So someone responded to my post about paragliding. I agree that I would do this sport because of the peaceful atmosphere. And I also agree that I wouldn't do it alone. Too many risks involved. All right, so that's nice. And I have a couple of comments there, but let's look at one more. So responses to skydiving. Oh, it looks fantastic. I would try it too, to see the lands from the bird's sight or the bird's eye view. And uh, the last commenter says, what if we do this together? So I love that we have people making plans. I feel that that's a really good sign of engagement and rapport. And so let's look at the final piece of the activity, the recap. So for this, while students are commenting on each other's work, me, I, as the teacher, put together just a list of all of the adventure sports or the extreme sports that they named. Um, and then they look at it and just count and comment how many they would try. So I still remember that one participant said they would try every activity, 12 out of 12. So Kate in Ukraine is a very adventurous person. <laughs> And let's see how this fits into the STAIR framework. So just a reminder of the pieces, we have four parts, the stimulus, action, interaction, and recap. And let's go step-by-step step in our analysis. So for stimulus, these are questions that um, of course we'll answer to analyze the activity, but more importantly, you can use them when you're designing your own activities. So how did we pull students in and what input did they respond to? So for this activity, let's see, I'm sure you all remember, we talked about a photo and we can discuss that as a whole class or in small groups. The next one is the action. So questions we ask is, uh, what did the students have to do or produce Kate, do you remember what we did for the action stage? Let's see. I think it's the part where they um, created a post on Padlet, right? <laughs> yep. So let's let's check our answers. Yes. So finding their own, making their own posts, and following the prompt. So I make sure I give them clear instructions to get a full response, and then for the interaction. Of course, how did students have to respond to each other? I am sure you all remember, but let's take a look. So they had to find things they had in common and try to persuade someone to change their mind. And I like to phrase it this way by language skill um, because it really helps me think about and plan the activity. So like maybe I need to teach some phrases on how to express agreement before we start that part. Um, and our last piece is the recap. And how do we pull the activity together? And for this one, it was asking the question, who's the most adventurous? And so let's look at that all together so you can read it easily. And if you want to do this activity, but your students don't have access to technology, here's a low tech adaptation. So for the First part, um, 
for the action, students can draw an image or just write a description on a piece of paper instead of doing their own post. For part two, we can hang up all of those papers around the room and do a gallery walk. So students walk around and read three different descriptions and then they write their comments on the paper. And finally, we can, um, as the teacher, just write a list of those sports on the board and ask for a show of hands. Who would do one of these? Who would do five? Who would do all 20? And speaking of adaptations, I have another question for you. So it is, what other topics might work in this activity? Yeah, let us know. And I have a very interesting um, something that happened, a person named Trellette, he put the same question right in the chat box. So I think maybe you are on the same page or you're thinking of the same ideas, or maybe Trellette was here in the morning session too. What other topics might work in this activity? And thank you for that question. Valdenicio said, um, how about they could create a moral at school using their photos? So maybe like a student code of conduct or um, some ideas or principles to live by at school. Christina says they could do hobbies. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. What else? Likes and dislikes. Jobs from Chow, household chores from Berezki. Maku says food, famous movies. Stereotypes, interesting. Food, mm -hmm. culture, animals, and games from Conchita. Typical foods from Faldenesio. True or false from Agarim. And a couple more here. Sarita says um, historical events. And Luisa says daily routines. So wonderful. Oh, and Beatrice says their favorite sandwiches. That sounds like a great time, a fun activity. Great, everybody. Thank you for sharing. I would enjoy that activity about sandwiches, definitely. So yes, you can see how just taking that one outline um, and with a single topic, you can substitute many different topics right on top of it and be ready to go. So I love those ideas. Thank you again. And we've done a lot already. Let's see where we are in our agenda. So we've already talked about the STEER framework, what it stands for and how it can help us. We looked at activity one and analyzed it. And so of course we have two more activities and then our reflections. So we're almost halfway through. All right, let's get into our next one. So the next activity is called decoration dictation. And this brings in some art and creativity and it focuses more on speaking and listening. So our last one was, had a lot of writing. So let's look at the objectives. Students will be able to describe a room in their house uh, or a room in their dream home. And this is great for beginners and intermediate students. You can certainly make it more challenging for advanced level students. So normally I include language points in my objectives, but I have a question for you. Uh, so what language points do, st do students need to know to complete this activity of describing a room? Yeah, what do you think everybody? To describe a room, what language points do students need to know? What do you think? Let's see here. We are going to be talking about a room in a person's house or maybe in their dream house, which is a great adaptation because maybe some folks don't always wanna talk about their current house. Let's see, Irina says there is, there are, great. Adjectives from Nid. Rocio says vocabulary and so does Ibrahim. Let's see, vocabulary for furniture from Natalia. Textures, colors. Miss Gisela says prepositions of place, adjectives and vocabulary related to buildings. And we have the simple present, the use of prepositions there is and there are from Pedro. Wonderful, thanks everybody. Oh, very nice. I feel like I didn't even need to write them on the slide, but we do have them. You, you covered all of our objectives. So 
like you all said, vocabulary for prepositions of place, household furniture, there is and there are, could all be really helpful for our students. And so here's the first step for the stimulus. It'll just be the teacher describes a room in their house and students draw what they hear. So whether you're online or in the classroom, I always like to um, give students a small hint. So I'll show you what I share on my screen. So it's just almost an empty room except for where my desk is. So this makes it easier for students to at least get started. Um, so I give this small hint, then I'll do a short dictation with about eight to 10 sentences like, uh, the door is in front of the desk. To the left of the door, there are nine pictures on the wall. And if your students have a lot of difficulty, it could be great to pause here and maybe do a review or a mini lesson on those prepositions or the vocab. Otherwise, you can move on to the next part, action. So now it's the student's turn to draw. So like we said, they can draw a room in their house or uh, their dream home, a room at school, a, a room from a book that they read. So a lot of ways to change it so students are very comfortable. The important thing here is that the student has the right answer because they'll draw it and have an answer key. They also can practice describing it with a partner or write down to plan what they will say. And you can scaffold this activity in a few ways. Um, so these are all those language points we just brainstormed. You can provide a list of the phrases they should be using, um, post some rules or reminders for using there is and there are. And you can also make this a little more challenging by asking them to add more descriptions, like all of those adjectives you mentioned, shape and color and material. Um, if you're online, you can encourage students to ask you for help. You can check in on them in breakout rooms. And of course, if you're doing this in class, you can walk around and help students practice. And I know we're always concerned about time in our class. So remember, this whole activity doesn't need to be done in one class period. Usually this is a place where I'll pause and assign it for homework. And then we pick up with the interaction phase the next day. So let's take a look at the interaction phase. Okay, so in groups of three to four, and these are in breakout rooms or maybe in class, one student at a time describes their drawing and then their group members draw the room. And you might be wondering how to facilitate this. So here are a few options uh, for drawing. Students can draw on a piece of paper and hold it up to the camera. They can draw on paper, take a picture and post it online somewhere like Padlet. They could draw digitally. The, web, the link there is just a, a very simple paint tool that's online um, and they can post that or they could draw digitally and share their screen with their group. So you have a wide range of options. Uh, and I'll say it's worth the effort to make it work. Um, and it's a, something you can teach your students to do and you can use it again in other activities. So let's look at some student work and how it came out. So here are some drawings of a living room uh, from two different people. So we can notice a few things about it. It looks like um, maybe someone mixed up left and right because we have the door and the plant on, I don't know the right answer, but on the wrong side of the room. Um, the other thing we can see is, I'm pretty sure this is a TV. So someone may have gotten confused about the difference between above or on. So is it on the table or above the table? And one more thing, the picture on the right is missing a few details, uh, the table and another piece of furniture, maybe that's a couch. Um, and so they couldn't keep up. Um, but what I love about this interaction phase is that one, there's natural feedback. 
So if a student missed something, the speaker knows and can point it out. So it's a natural breakdown of communication and it gets repaired really naturally. Um, and I also love the way that this empowers students because there's always one person in the group who knows the answer because it's their room and their drawing. So this really helps students have confidence and strive to express themselves clearly. So finally, for the recap stage, the speakers can choose which, which picture was the most accurate and share it with the class. So this is a very simple recap and it might sound something like this. Uh, this is the most accurate picture because, and again, what I like about this is that we emphasize the best listeners by accuracy of the drawing. We're not rewarding someone for being, we're not punishing someone for being a poor artist, which is a relief to me because I am not very artistic. So I think that's a really important thing to emphasize with all of your students is that it's accuracy. So if any of you have an asynchronous class where you don't meet with your students, you can still do this activity. And here's an adaptation. So for the stimulus, I, as the teacher, post a model. And maybe I'll also include instructional materials like a video lesson on prepositional phrases or a vocab list of furniture. Then for the action, Students make a recording of their description and post it. Um, so again, this is Padlet. And as nice as the teacher, you can just look really quickly to see if everyone has participated. And you might get an idea by the length of their recording, who worked really hard and who maybe didn't speak enough. And then the interaction takes some coordinating and assigning groups, but this is what it could look like. Uh, so you can see our groups at the top and students need to listen to the recordings of their group members, draw and post their drawings. And so the students only post in their one groups column and you can see those variety of options. We have like a digital drawing that was shared as well as a hand drawing and a picture was uploaded. And finally, for the recap, Padlet allows you to turn comments on or off. So here we turned on the comments and uh, the original speaker can select the most accurate. So it says, this is the most accurate, nothing is missing, good job. Uh, but and feedback from a meet. So that's a student giving their classmate feedback, which is really nice. And so let's see it all together in our framework. So. Uh, we did a dictation by the teacher that everyone tried. Students did their own. Then they listened to their group members' descriptions and drew, uh, had a drawing for each group member. And then the speakers chose the best drawing based on accuracy. So I have another question, which is, I think, important for all of you who really want to focus on recapping. Can you think of another way to recap this activity? Wonderful. Yeah. Seeing a lot of great comments about these activities. Um, let us know, everybody, what would be another way to recap this activity? And quickly, uh, let's see, a nice comment from Abdul Asil says, it would be so nice if we had the pupils peer correct each other. So that's a great aspect to a lot of these activities that you're sharing with us um, is that element of peer feedback, peer correction, interaction. What's another way to recap with this activity, everybody? What do you think? Let's see, Katarina agrees with you that Padlet and Flipgrid are really nice tools. You could also use Jamboard, says TCJ. Let's see, what other ways could you recap? You could do breakout rooms and give feedback from Susana. You could do direct feedback from members, from Ibrahim. Mm -hmm. And um, Maidana says Jamboard and Mind Map. Ms. Gisela says you can ask students questions about the way they felt while drawing related to their listening. Great. 
Great. You could do a list with a star on it. You could do quizzes. You could do Padlet or Jamboard. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for sharing. Thank you. Thank you for all of your tech tips and recommendations. I'm sure our participants find that helpful. And some other recaps you can. So I love that idea of like just reflecting on the experience. Uh, you can also do things like which room seems the most comfortable to you or look at the drawings of the rooms, choose one design that you like, add it to your room so you can kind of shop around um, and just extend the way you uh, respond to each other. So thanks again, and let's go on to our final activity. So this activity brings in grammar, writing, and speaking, and it's really one of my favorites. So here are the objectives. Students will be able to describe a dream that they had using the past progressive or past continuous, whatever you call it, um, and the simple past. And uh, it's great for intermediate students. It can also be used with advanced level students for a review or for descriptive language as well. And uh, so how do we start? So first, uh, in groups, students complete a dictogloss of a weird dream. So I wanted to give you the dictogloss instructions in case it's a new idea for you. The uh, objective of a dictogloss is for students to create a summary. So unlike a traditional dictation, instead of writing word for word, students get the gist as long as it's accurate. Um, so the instructions, the steps are, one, the teacher prepares a short paragraph to read. So in my case, it's a dream I had. Then you tell students the goal that they're trying to get just the big idea, not every word. And you can read the paragraph to them when they listen only. Then read it again and students take notes. Put the students into groups and they use their notes and what they remember hearing to recreate the paragraph. And as needed, depending on how stuck they are, you can read the paragraph again. And finally, students compare their paragraph with the original. So how does it work for this activity? So for this, I prepared a short paragraph. It was probably about five to seven sentences about a weird dream. And students worked in groups. And you can see they were working uh, on a shared slide. So I could see the types of mistakes they were making. I could help correct them. And I could also tell who was really stuck and needed to hear it again. Um, and this also serves as a needs assessment since our objective is about the simple past and past continuous. If students that keep using it really easily, then I know uh, who won't need much help and some other students will need more support. You'll also notice how this serves as a model for the action phase. So students write down their own dreams. Uh, and if you have any students who say that they don't remember their dreams, you can give them a lot of a bunch of pictures as a prompt and they can invent one. Um, and then they should answer the questions in the instructions. So things like, where were you? What did you see? What were people doing or wearing? How did you feel? What happened? And how did you feel when you woke up? And we can take a look at some student work. And so we have two posts that are really nicely written, very accurate, and answer all the questions. And uh, you might be thinking like, okay, these are nice, but what about the low level students in my class? Can they do this? And so when we look at those, um, I do make editing and correcting part of the action phase. And when we look at these, the next set of student work, so we can see these are just as long, if not longer than the other two. And these are two students who kind of struggled in class and weren't as confident. But you can see that they really had a lot to say. And then using the Padlet function, I was able to highlight some mistakes so that they could fix it during class. Um, so by giving those really clear questions to answer and a very clear prompt, uh, everyone can do this activity. 
And let's take a look at the interaction stage. So the main idea here is retelling, listening, and selecting the weirdest dream from the group. But I also added in another piece. So it's in your group, share your dreams. Talk about what you think each dream meant. So for example, it might sound like, I had the weirdest dream. I was flying over our school. And then the interpretation might be like, oh, I think your dream means that you feel in control of your life. What a good dream. Um, I love joining breakout rooms during this activity. My students come up with the greatest interpretations. And so when everyone has told their dream as a group, they decide who to nominate and who will present to the whole class. So that takes us to our recap, which is another simple one. Uh, so for this, we have a vote. The nominees from each group retell their dream to the whole class. And then we just do, we can use a poll, a show of hands, vote in the chat, whatever works. And um, you can see in this class, Valentina had the weirdest dream. <laughs> and if you are all together, maybe you can give a prize, like a box of relaxing tea to help them have better sleep. And so let's put this one all together. Um, so we had a dicto gloss, students write their own dream. Do we rem what was the interaction piece? Do we remember? Had a, kind of had two parts. Yeah, do you remember everybody? What was the interaction piece in this activity? Do you remember? Let's see if anybody remembers over here. I know that the, if I remember correctly, the students had to interpret the dream. Is that right? And then I think there was another piece to it. Does every, anybody else remember? Let's see, Christina says sharing the dreams. And Grecia says this is a cool activity that she will like to, would like to try. But what was the other piece of that interaction, Stephanie? Well, let's take a look. So like you said, everyone retold their dreams. Group members offered interpretations, but before we came back together, they had to nominate one person from the group to uh, present for the vote. And so I wanna just re-emphasize here that this interaction phase does so much. Um, it builds rapport because of the way students are accustomed, become accustomed to talking and listening to each other. Uh, it gives me as the teacher time to monitor activities. I can read their posts and their dreams and give feedback in written feedback. We can also listen in on discussions and find out how everyone's doing. I don't always need to collect a lot of work and correct everything. Um, and it's just really fun. My students get really lively when we do this. Um, and they also know that if they don't do their individual action piece, they'll miss out on all the fun during class. So let's, this, let's bring this all together for our own recap stage of this session. So we covered the background and three activities, and we can review our objectives. You can think about how confident do you feel in each objective. So our first one was, you can use three specific activities in class. So hopefully with the range and the adaptations we talked about, you feel like you can use each one. Uh, we also, um, Hopefully you can use this to design some new activities or maybe the same style with a new topic. Uh, so the questions we asked ourselves for each stage can help you choose appropriate activities for each section of the framework. And finally, you already mentioned that um, lots of us need to work or not need to maybe want to work on interactions and recaps. So I think you have an idea of what you're going to focus on. And um, so I think we're all usually very skilled at giving our students clear tasks to complete individually, but the STAIR frameworks helps us build a lesson around that. So students have more opportunities to speak with each other and you as the teacher have more chances to give small mini lessons or feedback. 
So before we go, I have two more questions for you. And the first one is which activity are you most excited to try in your classroom? Is it sense of adventure, decoration, dictation, or who had the weirdest dream? Okay, what do you think everybody? Which activity are you most excited about? Joanna says sharing the dream or the uh, who had the weirdest dream. We see a couple of other people saying number three or number two. Who had the weirdest dream is what Yulia is going to try. Irina says number three, decoration dictation from IGRM. Great. The last one from Ms. Gisela. And we also have people saying the first and second as well. So it looks like people are gonna be trying some of these great ideas very soon in their classrooms. Great, thank you. I hope they go well. And I have one more for you. So, did your answer change from the beginning? But uh, now, which piece of the framework are you gonna focus on the most in your next lessons? Is it the stimulus, action, interaction, or the recap? Yeah, what do you think, everybody? We asked you which uh, stage or piece that you needed to focus on most at the beginning, but now maybe you've had a chance to think about this. Let's see, it looks like a lot of people are saying number four, they're going to focus on the recap piece. Ibrahim says he will try two and three, action and interaction. Let's see, all of them from Yulia. Mm -hmm. Valdenicio says these activities give students opportunities to express themselves, absolutely. And Zamsakul says, especially number three is what, that, what he will um, focus on. So wonderful, thank you for sharing everybody. Yes, thank you. And if you do go back and review this webinar or the slides, remember there's a small list of activities you can do for each stage. So you might get some other ideas now that you have a lot of examples. Um, so thank you for that. And finally, thank you so much for participating today. And I hope that you get a chance to use these activities and um, just keep in mind, if this is a big switch for you and your students, it's, it'll take some time for everyone to come around and get used to being more active and being more interactive in class. So um, I hope you don't give up and that you keep going to the top of the STAIR framework and that you feel like the person in this picture when you get there. That's me, that's the only extreme sport I do is hiking. <laughs> so I hope you and your students feel triumphant and proud after you try these activities. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was a great presentation. And I think a lot of our participants have some really fun and practical ways to make sure that they get all the components of the STAIR framework into their lessons. So thank you so much. And of course, we'd always, as always, we'd like to thank our audience for your engagement and participation today. It's always wonderful to have you here with us. Please continue to share your ideas and questions and comments in the chat or with your viewing groups after today's session ends.